Welcome, and thank you for coming to the site and to the webinar series from the Ioneer Foundation called Sight and Sound Bites. This bi-weekly webinar series, which started in April of 2020, highlights the research at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Today's topic is visual impairment and visual rehabilitation. I'm Lawton Snyder, CEO of the Ioneer Foundation. The Ioneer Foundation supports research to advance care for vision, hearing, balance, voice, and cancers of the head and neck at the two world-renowned departments of ophthalmology and otolaryngology at the University of Pittsburgh. The funds we provide uh, from the Ioneer Foundation to support research are only made possible because of philanthropic support. And uh, thank you for all of our donors and who are joining us. And thank you for those who are learning more about the Ioneer Foundation today. Um, some housekeeping rules. This is um, Zoom product. So when you Zoom with your family, maybe you use chat, but for this, for this presentation, and chat is disabled but you can use the Q&A function. So that's a bubble on the bottom of your screen. And please, as, as you have questions, please type them in um, and we will get to those at the end of the program. Refrain, if you will, from asking personal health questions that uh, wouldn't be of interest to the rest of the audience. I'll, uh, I may screen those out as I'm reading them, but um, we'll try to get to all of your questions. And if there are some questions we can answer afterwards, we will do so. You'll receive a survey tomorrow on today's program. We appreciate everybody helping us with that so we know uh, what we're doing right, what we can improve on. And we will um, add you to our email list for future webinars unless you tell us otherwise. And um, I'm really pleased to bring you today's program. As I uh, mentioned earlier, this is something that many of our I've been working here at the Ioneer Foundation now for 11 years and working with many people with vision uh, disorders. And this topic is one that, that I know um, is important because I've seen how our low vision specialists and, and our team of people at, at the UPMC Eye Center have helped many of the, the patients that we work with. So um, this is a good program, take notes, but we will we'll record it for you. So, um, uh, you know, um, keep that in mind. If you uh, miss anything, we can send that recording to you later. Uh, I'd like to ask Dr. Jose Elaine Sahel, our distinguished professor and chairman of the Department of Ophthalmology at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine and the exceptional class professor at the Sorbonne University in Paris and the Ioneer Foundation Endowed Chair to introduce uh, today's program. Dr. Sahel, thank you and, um, and take it away. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for attending these webinars. Uh, so I won't be long because I think the content of the today is uh, as, as usual, but uh, especially is very of interest for many of you. So low vision is not something which is uh, like uh, by default approach uh, we have in the department. We believe that it's part of a continuum of care we have to provide to patients. So we certainly want to make the right diagnosis of the best possible therapeutic, but it turns out that uh, the real goal is to improve the lives of the people that uh, come to us. And uh, which means that uh, if we cannot restore 100% 2020 vision to our patient, there are many ways we can help them to live a comfortable life. And uh, we are very fortunate to have in the department a real good expert that are not only technically excellent, but also as human beings caring and making sure that the experience that our patients can feel and the output when they leave us is going to be life-changing. And uh, the reason it is, is that it's not just once, we are really following our patient and trying to adapt to the needs and to adapt sometimes to the evolution of the disease. Later, when I, after the, seven, the webinar, we'll come back to the future of that because this is, as you will see, there is a large panel of technologies that exist, a large panel of approaches that are just, just technologies that really dealing with individual needs that are developed in the department by Dr. Smith and uh, Mrs. Stant. But on top of that, they are also involved in very innovative research program because there is nothing like restoring vision that doesn't require adjustment to the restored vision. And we are currently, as you know, working on gene therapy, prostate many approaches and stem cell therapies to improve vision, but this means that people have to adjust to that and to learn how to use the potentially restored vision. And uh, so what we try to do is to help the low vision patient to use as good as they can what they have 
And for people that lost most of it, to restore some of it, but then our low vision expert can help us to use as best as possible. You'll also hear at the end what we are trying to develop with a new building that is under construction. What will be the plans for the future to make this an integral part of the department as it is already, but with an even enhanced facility. So without further ado, I'm going to go to, to ask Dr. Smith to take on and to really describe a part of the approaches they are developing in the department together with Mrs. Stance. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thanks, Dr. Sahel. I uh, really appreciate it and actually honored that I'm um, participating in uh, this wonderful program to provide uh, information to our patients. I think it's so um, important that people learn about what's new, also learn about what's available because sometimes we just don't know or we may get information from somebody else that we just don't understand. So, you know, the topic of our conversation today is, is visual impairment and vision rehabilitation. And so what I try to do is, you know, kind of go over things and what does this really mean? What is it that we really do? What's available out there currently, um, our approach um, and, uh, and, and what are we doing in the future to kind of help um, change things to make things better for people that suffer from, from vision loss? Um, so as Dr. Sal and Loni mentioned, um, I'm an optometrist uh, by training with uh, additional uh, residency training in the area of low vision and vision rehabilitation. And um, I'm quite lucky, uh, actually I'm very lucky um, to be working at UPMC in the Department of Ophthalmology um, because I think um, I, I can honestly say in my career I've not had a more supportive faculty, a more supportive chair than Dr. Sahel and certainly the support of the Ioneer Foundation as well as just enjoying my patients. So I've been with the department for a fairly long time um, and I continue to uh, be really uh, honored to be an integral part of, of the faculty. Uh, as well as myself, we have occupational therapists that work in our clinic to help patients that have vision loss. Um, Holly Stance is going to be speaking as well as, um, as well today about uh, some technologies and some rehabilitation strategies that that are integral to help somebody um, manage their daily activities with vision loss. And it's, she's actually quite exceptional because she holds a dual certification um, as being a specialized low vision therapist in the realm of occupational therapy, but also a certified low vision therapist as well, which is, is pretty rare in the country. So I kind of wanted to break the talk up into a few different things just so we can kind of get all on the same page with one another. So we'll talk about a few common eye conditions that we all hear about or may hear that family members have and that we see quite frequently in the clinic. We won't spend a ton of time on them, but just a kind of brief understanding of what they are. And then really, what does it mean to have low vision or what, what does that mean? And how the low vision exam differs from a regular either medical exam or regular eye exam for glasses, and then what we can do. And intermingled with this, we'll talk about new technologies and new research that we're, act, what, that we're physically doing, um, actively doing within the department. So this is the eye, um, as if we cut the eye um, in half, and light enters from the far left, and it enters the cornea, which is a clear surface, that helps the eye focus through the lens, which is right in the middle, and back onto the retina. So the retina is this inner lining um, of the eye that acts kind of like film to a camera. And so as it gathers light rays in, and information, it then sends that um, information back through the optic nerve, which is kind of the stem on the back to our brain, and that helps us see, that's, that's how we see. So when we're talking about vision loss, vision loss can happen in a number of different places within the system. The eye is pretty small, um, but it has a lot of components. So we can have problems either in the cornea, we can have problems in the lens, problems in the retina, or within the optic nerve, or with a combination of all of them. So when we talk about risk of vision loss, the risk of vision loss increases 
substantially as we get older. And I think as people are living longer and as we have better um, medical treatments for people to live healthy um, lives, we are seeing a lot more um, vision related um, issues um, such as cataracts, which in the United States, cataracts are for the most part treatable, although they do account for um, a leading cause of blindness worldwide. Um, we have glaucoma, uh, which is we'll talk about in, in a minute, macular degeneration, uh, diabetic retinopathy. There's many genetic retinal diseases or genetic eye diseases, people that suffer from strokes or injury, and even nutritional or vitamin deficiencies, especially worldwide. So a common um, eye condition that we, we hear about, uh, especially with family members, I think most of us might know somebody with age-related macular degeneration or AMD. And this is um, a disease of the retina that affects the area of central vision. So it affects the film or the, the lining that helps um, control our detailed vision. So patients with macular degeneration will often have reduced vision. They may have blind spots in their vision where, you know, a lot of people say, well, I can't see straight ahead, but I can see, you know, a penny on the ground. And that's, that's really what macular degeneration does. The peripheral vision remains intact, but our central vision either becomes reduced or sometimes distorted. Um, it's not painful. And although it can, um, Although it's, it's, it's in both eyes, it's often asymmetric. Um, it can advance slowly or it can change um, very rapidly and it, it just all depends on um, the person. With macular degeneration, there's two types, a dry form and a wet form. And as we look at dry macular degeneration, this is the back of the eye. And you, some of you may be able to see some um, kind of yellow spots within that, the pink, um, where my arrow is, um, or where the arrow is pointing, that's uh, drus and changes, which is ultimately what's effect, uh, impacting the vision. As we look at the picture on the left, that's a scar from dry macular degeneration, and there's no surgeries um, that can prevent dry macular degeneration from treating or from from improving. Um, however. Uh, you know, we recommend UV protection and vitamin supplementations to help uh, slow the progression of dry macular degeneration. We can also have wet macular degeneration, and this is similar to dry macular degeneration, except there's blood vessels that form that are not normal to the eye, and they can bleed and leak um, and cause uh, vision loss in that regard. With wet macular degeneration now, we have um, newer therapies such as injections in the eye, which can help, um, help prevent as much uh, vision loss um, as compared to uh, our treatment options that we had uh, historically. This is a grid that shows how, if we look at this, there's some black spots or some waviness there. That's really what the patient is experiencing when they're looking straight ahead. And as we translate that into real life, that is uh, a young person that's on a soccer team and you know we can see his body and his hands and maybe even part of the soccer ball, but we are unable to see his face. So that's typically how that translates into real life um, for somebody with macular degeneration. With glaucoma, Glaucoma is kind of the opposite of macular degeneration. Glaucoma affects your peripheral vision and it affects the optic nerve. And it's usually based upon um, a risk factor of high eye pressure in the eye, although it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. But um, the pressure um, to the eye affects the optic nerve, causing damage to the optic nerve, as we can see in the, the top right-hand picture, the optic nerve becomes bigger, more open. And what that translates is into loss of your peripheral vision, um, which means that we may bump into things, we may miss stairs and curbs, but um, early on we can see what's straight ahead. Diabetic retinopathy is, is, fair, is very common, especially in the United States. And this can actually 
um, have very devastating effects on vision, um, both central vision and peripheral vision. So we get abnormal blood vessels that form and they're fragile and break and they can bleed and leak into the back of the eye, which therefore causes um, damage uh, to the, the retina or the sensory layer of the eye. It could also impact the optic nerve and we can um, have, uh, have affected central vision or detailed vision as well as affected peripheral vision. So that's just a very quick, by all means, not in depth detail, uh, uh, just overview of some common conditions that we see. But what does this really mean? What is low vision? So basically the way I look at low vision or my interpretation of low vision, it's a reduction in your ability to see or your ability of vision that can't be corrected with medications, standard glasses, conventional contact lenses, in surgeries, and it really impacts the ability for an individual to perform daily living activities. So seeing food on your plate, tying your shoes, walking down the stairs, reading your mail, things like that. Um, but it's not limited to only not having good vision or how big or small you can see things are, but how well you see things to the side, how well you do from changes from light to dark, whether you can detect colors, whether you're sensitive to light. So all these really, um, if it's impacting how you function, then you have to some degree a level of visual impairment. So once you know, we find, establish that we have a visual impairment, well, what can be done? That's always the question. You know, patients often hear that from physicians or they may hear there's nothing that can be done and that may be true with certain surgeries or interventions, but we, as with the body, just like if you break your hip or you know, break your arm, there's rehabilitation strategies that really can be implemented into daily living activities. So when we look at a low vision evaluation, it differs quite, quite um, variably. We wanna make sure we know what you wanna do, what can you do, what can't you do, and what do you need to do better? And then we measure how well you can see, but then how you're able to use what you can see to do what you need to do. And then we can recommend specialized equipment, tools, glasses um, that may, um, re, you know, different research um, uh, clinical trials that are going on to kind of help um, meet your visual needs and goals. So we use different charts that can be held at different distances. Um, we use charts that have print on them so we can hear how fast you read, how accurate you read. We measure contrast, how light and dark the print needs to be in order for you to see. We also measure color vision. Um, and then once we get all of those measurements, we then talk about this is what we have, you know, what you're able to see, but what is it that you need? So do you need to see a bus sign? Do you need to see a sign in a grocery store? Do you need to read your mail? Do you need to see food on your plate? Do you need to be able to read the computer? And so then we divide that into kind of treatment goals or treatment strategies. And the way I think about it is defining them as something that occurs far away. So is it something that's far away from you? Is it something that's intermediate like a computer? Or is it something up close like you wanna be able to do to read? And then we talk about, are you gonna be doing it for a long time or a short time? So are we gonna look at a bus number? That's something that may happen very quickly, or are you gonna sit and watch a movie or a theater production? So if we talk about distance goals, so anything um, far away, we can talk about some telescopes. So these are a variety of handheld telescopes that we can use for people to see street signs, to see signs at the grocery store, um, to see bus numbers. And, or these are specialized glasses that in some states can be used for driving, which Pennsylvania laws will be changing um, as well to at some point incorporate these in. It, there was a house bill that was just passed. So that's very exciting for us here and we may have a lecture about that in the future as we get more information talking about, um, about these types of telescopes. 
there's telescope telescopic glasses that can be used for um, watching theater, watching television. And then there's a very exciting new technology. This is known as iris vision. Um, it's been um, really honed in on helping patients see it uses a virtual reality headset and a smartphone. And they've really updated the software to make it very user friendly uh, and to really have a significant impact on, um, on, on people's ability to see. And currently, we have an iris vision study that's at the Eye Institute, which is kind of looking at how this device is helping people. So maybe in the future, we can get insurance companies to pay for this to make sure that we can develop better um, strategies, better software updates. Uh, so we're looking at how, if people can recognize faces, check writing, uh, if they can tell their med medicines, and how they're doing with dexterity and depth perception. And that's in conjunction with the Human uh, Balance Movement Lab here. So for patients with the iris vision study that we have currently, they have to have vision loss that's in their central vision. Their side vision has to be pretty good, their peripheral vision between the ages of 18 and 80. And they can't use the, a device like this uh, before um, with a visual acuity of 2200 or worse. And so if anybody is, you know, interested, we can, we would certainly glad to, you know, review and see if you meet any of these inclusion criteria to see um, if you would like to participate in the study. As we're talking about studies a little bit, we have uh, another study which uh, was the first to occur in the United States here in Pittsburgh which is the Prima study um, that was sponsored by Apexium Vision, um, which is a retinal implant in the eye. Uh, I serve with Dr. Martel, who's our retinal surgeon as the co-PI on, on, on this study. And basically it's an implant in the retina and the, the film of the eye that uh, can gather light it's powered by infrared light. And then what it does is it uses a, a special pair of glasses um, to project the light and interpret and process the light to form artificial vision. And so basically we're bypassing the part of the eye that's damaged. And it's, it's very important to understand that the rehabilitation process is extremely important with, with this study and studies that are like that because we're learning how to use vision differently. Um, and so both myself and uh, our occupational therapists work very hard with the patients to try to uh, get them to adapt and be able to harness the, the vision differently. Another study that we have going on is a is study for, by, um, known as GenSight, um, and it is for patients with retinitis pigmentosa. And basically it's an intraocular injection into the eye that uses special light sensitive proteins in an area of the retina to bypass the damaged portion of the retina to help patients be able to move around better. And it uses a special pair of glasses um, to uh, interpret the light, help um, process the light. And again, um, the rehabilitation process is critical so that we can kind of use our sight uh, differently than how we were born. So those are a few distance um, goals and distance uh, devices. If we talk about reading, we can talk about handheld magnifiers for seeing uh, the, that are prescription that are different than over-the-counter handheld magnifiers for reading labels and menus. We can talk about very strong reading glasses to be able to um, do up-close tasks, um, specialized electronic magnifiers, electronic magnifiers that are bigger. And again, our friend, the Iris Vision device, which can be used for reading as well. So there are lots of different categories of, of, of devices that are available that can really help us use our remaining sight, maybe in a different way than what we're accustomed to, but in a more functional and practical manner. You know, what we were talking about before this morning with Holly is, you know, if it's going to take somebody an hour to read one sentence, that's not necessarily practical. So we may choose different tools to kind of make that easier 
to kind of move that uh, in a better, um, in, in, in a more appropriate fashion. Intermediate goals, we can, this would be computer, using your iPad, writing, crocheting. There's specialized tools such as loops like jewelers would use or, or surgeons would use. Um, but actually technology is where things are key and where things are advancing all the time. So I'm actually gonna turn the presentation over to one of my team members, Holly, um, and she's gonna talk about exciting new technologies and applications that you can get using your iPhone, your iPad, um, and lots of different helpful tools. So I'm gonna move out of the way and Holly's gonna take over. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, I'm very honored and blessed to be part of this program. I just want to uh, mention one quick thing about occupational therapy because I think it's really important as part of a, a great team. So occupational therapy is the science of living, and we look at the whole person. And I think the important part of our role is that we're able to focus on the entire situation that comes with the patient. We have the patient engage in personally meaningful activities, individually tailored programming, client-centered and uh, goals are established after the evaluation. And we're looking at the structured approach to training and we're always looking at training through practice and so that the patient is able to understand and learn everything they need to do to be able to better use the vision that they have. So again, occupational therapy is an absolute uh, tremendous asset to this team. Um, Dr. Smith is very, uh, very uh, tremendous with the patients that he sees and he gives them great hope. And it's our job then to uh, work again with the client and the patient and, and recognize what else we can do to help them so that they are actually able to regain some uh, opportunities in their life that may be missing because of the challenges of uh, changing vision. So we're gonna talk a little bit about technology and I, I wanna kind of go over this very quickly because I know we're, we have uh, such a, an opportunity here but we have a short time. Uh, technology, as Dr. Smith said, is, is actually in our opinion, uh, one of the, the foremost uh, opportunities for patients to really have an engagement with uh, changing vision. So here in the slide, we have uh, a couple different things. We have the Amazon Echo, which is a device that a lot of people got maybe on Black Friday. It's a great opportunity to um, uh, engage a person with low vision or any type of vision impairment because you can ask the device to identify what it's looking at. So for example, in the picture, a patient is holding up or a person is holding up a, a bottle of medication and you just give a command to the uh, Amazon Echo and it tells you what it sees. So that's humongous in, in the world of vision. That is an opportunity with the OCR capacity that actually helps someone uh, to be able to see what's there, which they can't normally read. There are multiple things coming out on the market there. And the picture also is a very expensive oven. It's around $3,000, but you can pair it to your phone. You can have the food cook uh, without any challenge whatsoever. You just uh, give a command to the phone and it directs the, the oven. So for those of us that uh, are challenged with in the cooking way, I think that's a great opportunity. Um, we're also looking at the technology because one of the main things that we focus on in our clinic too, uh, number one, we certainly do want to engage with what's important to you and, and uh, when you come to our clinic as far as your goals, but we will always remind you that our number one concern is making sure that you maintain your safety in your home so that you can continue to stay there. Um, it's very important as occupational therapists uh, to re re uh, visit how safe mobility uh, challenges could be. We also wanna look at if there's something in the environment we need to change to help, we also look at that also. So with regards to the technology, uh, multiple things are coming out. We do have uh, a, a society that's very much in tune with using a cell phone and iPad. So we're very uh, lucky to have that chance to be able to work with those types of tools because in the long run, they're uh, easily accessible and less costly than some of the magnification devices that are out there. So we look at the technology again to help on multiple levels, not only just with ADLs and IADLs, which means the things that you have to do every day, uh, also man maintaining some sense of 
a capacity with your leisure skills. That's very important. As most of us know, when the pandemic has occurred, people are socially isolated. So even with that being said, if you have vision impairment, sometimes people are even more apt to stay away from places because they're concerned that they can't see well. So the iPad is something that's very uh, helpful to promote the use of social media, use of um, being able to do Zoom and different chatting that they can actually engage with their families. So one of the things that I want to talk about is the Seeing AI app. This is a, a, a very uh, wonderful um, development that came just a couple of years ago. It was uh, pre presented by the Microsoft Corporation. There was a gentleman that had low vision that developed this and it's free. So if you have an Apple product, you please try to download this. This is an absolute tremendous asset to you. It has optical character recognition, which means it does just kind of do some reading. The, the camera takes a photo of what it sees and then it turns it into a speech. So it's absolutely wonderful. It does lots of different things. It can look at your money and tell you what the dollar bill is. It can also look at a product. It can be a barcode reader. Um, it helps to identify things that are in the room, such as people. It won't tell you who they are, but it'll tell you uh, a 35 year old woman with glasses looking happy or what have you. Um, so there are many, many apps that are available out there in our clinic. Uh, we do work with a lot of these apps when you come into the clinic. We try to work with the technology that you have so that you can have extra access. So it's uh, very, very important to us um, to ask you, you know, are you interested in technology? Is it something you um, feel that you'd be able to try? And we are always hopeful because um, as far as we're concerned in our department, technology knows no age. So we had a, a woman in our department that was 98 that was a very, very technology savvy. So don't ever feel that your age has to keep you away from any kind of learning with technology. So these are a multitude of different apps and they're free. You can have some for reading, you can have some for um, uh, mobility. Uh, one of the great ones on this slide is the soundscape. It's three-dimensional. It gives you a direction. It tells you what's going on in the environment. And again, these are all free. So another thing that we do in our clinic, we look at the uh, ability to have applications put onto the computer. And this one here is a ZoomText uh, product, which is made by ZoomText. And what it does is it allows you to magnify up to 30 or 40 percent, uh, 40 X rather, and you can have a background color difference. You can also have it read to you. Um, I do wanna also inform you that if you have a computer right now that has Microsoft 10 on it, you, are, you will be able to actually have a, a great opportunity to do some of this on your own without having to buy something like Zoom text. So um, also with iOS is a very, very good product. Right on your phone, you'll have a magnifier that you may not have known about. You'll have the capacity uh, to have the screen read to you if you turn it on. The um, Apple company is very, very fond of helping those that are visually challenged. They also do other things to help uh, anyone who has challenges trying to use their product. And they also provide an 800 number for people that are having challenges. So it's a great uh, company as far as uh, organization goes to help those with visual impairment. So Windows 10 accessibility, all you have to do is go onto the computer and you can find the ease of access area and you can have uh, the, the color background changed. You can have it speak to you and uh, uh, several other items that can be helpful to you. So that's, that's very positive as far as we're concerned because it does again give more universal accessibility to everyone. And it's not that just if you have you know, bought the, the um, the technology and put it on your computer where this now you have the computer coming with the technology. So as far as what we do in our clinic, uh, we work very closely with Dr. Smith. We do a functional vision evaluation. We're looking at your ability to move your eyes. We're looking at some of the visual field that you have. We're making sure that you are able to attend to what you're looking at. But mostly for us, we're looking at the safety factors. So we're looking at when we're having you do a reading activity, we, we wanna know what the largest size print that you're able to read uh, with comfort. And then we can tell you about whether you need to make it bigger and then you can have it uh, for different homework assignments or what have you that we might give you from our clinic. Um, contrast sensitivity, as Dr. Smith said uh, for a moment, it's very, very important because in our area, looking at fall prevention is number one and contrast sensitivity, if you have a challenge with that, can be something that could be detrimental to your safety. Um, it is when you're not able to always notice the differences in the color and the degradation of the color, for example, the outside sidewalk, you may not be able to see if something's darker and you might trip. So we're looking at that, we're looking at depth perception, uh, technology, fall prevention, 
And this is a machine on the left. If you can see that, it's a, it's a light machine. We're using this all the time because we wanna help you determine what type of lighting you might need in your home because um, one of the first line responses that we always think of that's very easy to fix is being able to look at lighting and also managing glare, those two things, along with the contrast enhancement. Those are areas that we can fix immediately. So when we look at the light box on the left, we'll tell you uh, by the uh, selection that you have that you what type of lighting you might need. Uh, we'll give you a, a range of a lumen of a bulb that would be helpful and where you would need it for what activity you're doing. So we're also looking at the glare because glare is an awful problem that happens many times with vision impairment. And we want to make sure that you're comfortable, especially going in and out of different lighting situations, so that you're also able to navigate safely in the environment. Um, and here's just an example of how we would mark um, some contrast to make it a little bit better. If you're going up and down the steps, you know, you might not be able to see the railing because it's the same color as the wall. So then we would recommend doing something different. Um, and another example, of course, on the side is the coffee cup. If you have a, a, a dark coffee in a white cup, that's very helpful. The device sitting on side of the cup is a liquid level indicator. And what happens there is if you pour the liquid, it will uh, beep just as much as your uh, smoke alarm would. So if you're um, tuned to that noise, you'll know that this is going next just as loud. Um, this is just a photo that I wanted to share with some of the environmental challenges that we all face in, as we have visual impairment. Um, the place is absolutely beautiful, but the colors are a little bit too much the same. The contrast is not very good. Um, so we would recommend changing that up a little bit, maybe putting a white pillow or a blanket on the brown chair so that you could recognize it. Um, the other thing is lighting is very, very important and um, being able to be safe in your environment. We would recommend different glare type of filters for yourself as well as the uh, curtain. The um, or cam is up. Do we want to do that or we want to? Um. Yeah, let's see if we can. Um, let me see if I can turn it. Okay. Go All right. So um, we're going to see if we can get the OrCam to work. This is the device that Dr. Smith was talking about. So what it is is basically um, it sets on your eyeglasses, and if you're having challenges with reading, all you have to do is be able to put the eyeglasses on, like this, and then I'm going to tap and point. Hmm. Well, there we go. It is raining, and we see a young EG. He went to you to take a and saw a. Can you show your leaf in the room? Well, it's reading a little bit, but not maybe as well as we would expect for the moment, but it is a great device because you can take it. It's portable and it looks like uh, everybody else is wearing the same type of glasses. And that's another thing that we talk about in our clinic. We address um, uh, when you have vision loss, there's some certain challenges that you might face and quality of life and perhaps even some sadness because you're not able to do what you did before. But we're always looking at all of the strategies that we can help you with. And we're looking at that there's great opportunities um, that you can still continue to do some of the wonderful things that you've been doing your, in your life. So that's one of the things that we're very interested in doing, looking at what our interests you, that you have and then building on the strengths with the, the, uh, the visual skills that we're training you with and then recognizing the capacity that you have to be able to uh, become independent again as much as possible. So the, the rehabilitation um, the component for success, actually we think number one is certainly um, a motivation is very helpful. We, we believe that uh, we, yes, you have a, a, perhaps a vision impairment, but we also know that you've made it this far in life with many, many challenges and this is one one, another challenge, but we're going to help you with learning strategies to make it better for you. Eccentric viewing is, again, we're looking at how to engage the retina that isn't working as well. So you might not look straight ahead, you might look to the side a little bit, but we're going to teach you those kinds of things so that you can use them uh, in your daily activities. Uh, mobility, we're looking at safety again, this is very important to us. Um, just very quickly, we all know that as we age is a great possibility of falling, but 25% of 65 year olds and above may fall. Low vision more than doubles that risk. So 50% of those who fall also will not report that to anybody because they're concerned about what happens if they keep falling. 
So our job in our clinic is to help, help you understand that we want to look at the environment and give you strategies that will keep you safe in your environment. Uh, again, most of us know that the aging population is going forward. By 2030, 20% of the population will be 65 or older. And so a lot of uh, those folks will have vision loss. And that's why it's very, very important for us to also look as, as a team to be able to help you manage as much as possible. So one of the things we also do is the mobility. We look at um, some of the challenges that you might have. So we're looking at making your devices that you use a little bit easier to see, uh, the functionality of that, including using a light. And also we do some sighted guide training, but if we feel that you need other outside assistance, we definitely will uh, make the referral to an orientation mobility specialist so that you can have the white cane training. And if you're having balance challenges, we often will refer out to the physical therapist to help as well, because we know that balance is very, very important in keeping you safe. This uh, We Walk technology is something that's pretty much new on the market. So this is a device that's um, able to give you extra information on your long cane. So you would buy it and you would put it onto the cane and it gives you other information that you might not be able to get with a cane. Um, this, this device is a couple hundred, I think it's around $500, but the point is it's very, very useful and helpful. But right now they have an app that is also called We Walk that you can use by itself and you can get some of the similar uh, strategies from that kind of uh, mobility. So I think for us, the biggest thing is that um, we're looking ahead to the future with all the technology that's coming out. As most of you know, Google Assist and Alexa, these are just two things that have come out very recently that are starting to help people do many, many, many tasks that they could thought that they could never do before, whether they have vision loss or other types of challenges. So building on that, along with uh, doing some of the, the type of um, um, scientific uh, studies that we're having now, we're going to go forward with opportunities. And so now is a great time with much hope for each and every one of you who might be facing vision impairment challenges. And while we did talk mostly about the disease processes that cause vision impairment, there are also a whole list of other types of uh, uh, situations that people will have vision impairment from, such as a stroke or diabetes. Uh, of course, we talked about that, but um, TBI or also Parkinson's disease. So we know that there's many times people have vision impairment that might not necessarily be recognized, and there's always something that we can do to help. So um, if um, I, I presume it's about time to start looking at questions. I don't know if anyone's asked questions, but I think uh, in our uh, situation here, we're more than happy to help you any way we can. You can reach out to either Dr. Smith or myself. We have a great team. We have Maria Shoemaker and Dana Arevich uh, on our team. And we know that uh, moving forward, we are doing uh, telemedicine and doing some tele uh, visits that way to help uh, engage. So we're happy to take questions and uh, Dr. Sahel is up next. Yeah, thank you, Holly. Uh, so I won't be long because I hope we'll, we'll have many questions and we at, at least we want to address any question you're asking. Uh, so uh, future is uh, bright because the technologies are evolving, but we want to make sure that these technologies are part of the uh, plan to care and also to make sure that this is useful in daily life. So uh, Dr. Smith presented some of the research that is ongoing in the department and together with Holly, testing enhanced reality, testing artificial retina, testing new gene therapies, and many other things, many new technologies that are becoming also quite inexpensive or, or even not sometimes free. But what we want is to have a way to measure the impact in daily life of visual impairment and also the benefit from any of these therapies of any of these technologies. So as part of that, the department is... Uh, already engaged into many uh, efforts, including collaboration with the uh, Balanced Laboratory to assess in real life the risk of falls, the risk of loss of orient orientation, the ability to coordinate the vision and the hand movements and grasping an object, for example. Uh, many of these tasks have now be, um, are now being measured in the department, but in the new building, which is as you go, if you go next to Boulevard of Your Life, you'll see that this is coming up quite nicely. Uh, in two years from now, we'll have also a dedicated 
created a very large platform for life skills ability. This platform will be specific to vision, but because our neighbors will be the rehabilitation department, there is also a more holistic approach of impairment that takes into account a multidimensional approach to impairment. Because sometimes people don't have only vision impairment, they can have hearing impairment, they can have mobility impairment, and we want to make sure that we have a, a global approach to that. So this platform will enable, similar to what I've done in Paris, the measurement of uh, uh, the speed when you walk, the risk of falls, the risk of bumping into an object, the ability to recognize, all of these metrics will be developed. But more importantly, the paradigms that are going to be tested will be developed by listening to you, listening to people that have low vision and asking them what is the most meaningful for them, what is the most impactful in their daily life and making sure that we can translate that into metrics that enable us to demonstrate that what we are, what we are doing is useful. And the, really what we want to build is a, a platform that is the voice of the patient. We want to be able to listen to you in the best possible way to translate that into innovation that is meaningful. So I'll stop here because hopefully we'll have many of our opportunities to share the progress in that. One of the good news that will be, which we are going to announce very soon is that we have now a partnership with the FDA. We have designed, decided that we are the site for assessment of low vision for new technologies, which tells that the platform that we are developing and the expertise that we have with Dr. Smith, Dr. Stance, and the team around us is really useful to determine what is good for you or not good for patients. But now I think uh, Gloni may have questions from you. And uh, I guess uh, you have the right people, not me, but uh, Dr. Smith and Dr. Stans to answer your questions. Well, uh, <clears throat> thank you, everybody. And I, you know, um, again, can't uh, tell uh, how much importance this is to uh, many of the people that, that uh, have signed in. I can tell that also by the number of questions that we're getting. And we just have a few minutes so that we should get to these. Um, but uh, um, uh, if you haven't asked a question yet, you can still type those in at the bottom, uh, click on Q&A and then type them in. So uh, first question, all these adaptive devices are wonderful. Would a neighborhood op optical shop practice have access to these products or is this the, in the domain of the more advanced hospital ophthalmology programs? Yeah, I mean, I think in the answer to that is it's, it's definitely going to be more of the academic ophthalmology practice settings. There are um, certain providers that may have um, a handful of prescription magnifiers, but I think in when we're talking about the whole, whole approach, especially with occupational therapists um, and, um, and uh, in the technology and especially with the research component, it's really gonna be an academic setting. Okay. So um, do you work with people to address challenges in employment and work environments? Yes, absolutely. Um, we, uh, we assess patients all the time, especially patients you know, come in with job jeopardy cases. I have this a lot where they may experience a rapid change in their vision and which really, um, challenges both their activities of daily living, just get, maintaining their daily health needs and activities, but as well as their occupational needs. So we certainly do assess them, make recommendations to the employer, uh, but we also are very fortunate to partner with a state-run organization called the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation and the Bureau of Blindness and Visual Services, which really then can implement things and help provide devices and um, other strategies within the workforce. So we're very lucky to be able to partner with agencies with the state um, and the city of Pittsburgh to help, um, to help as many people as we can for sure. Here's someone who says, hi, Dr. Smith, former patient. Um, is low vision something that is genetic or is it something that occurs due to age or external factors? Um, I think it could be a combination of all of those things. So, you know, with some of um, the eye conditions that we know, there's certainly genetic um, uh, components to that. And we're actually very fortunate to have a wonderful uh, genetic specialist and genetic counselor here um, that can help do genetic testing and help isolate um, uh, issues or isolate the mutations in genes, which then can help open up um, to access clinical trials for our patients. So that's really important. And we work very closely with her. 
Um, some of the conditions are aging changes. You know, it's kind of if we, I tell patients, especially with cataracts, for example, if you live long enough, you're going to get them. Um, it just kind of depends. And we know that even with certain conditions like macular degeneration, age is the number one risk factor as well as a history of smoking, but there is a genetic component um, as well. So I think, I think it can be a combination of all of those things. So um, someone did ask here for a list of the apps that we showed. It said it went by too quickly, which is um, understandable. But uh, we will do this one. We'll, we, this is recorded, so we'll send this to uh, everybody on today's um, uh, listing. But also, uh, maybe we could send you a list of the apps. Would that be okay? Or we can, you know, if they need printed copies or whatever that may be, we can certainly make that available without an issue. That's no problem. We'll, we'll send that out to everybody because I think sure. that there's a lot of interest there. Uh, what age group does your clinic serve? Uh, I have I said, all age groups. So I think, you know, um, this week I had somebody that was five years old and I had somebody that was a hundred years old. So wow. pretty much if you're, I guess pretty much if you're old enough to talk, I think that we'll see you. So, uh, <laughs> um, please repeat the name of the app created by the VIP um, AI. Uh, I think it's called Seeing AI. Seeing AI. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, Holly, uh, do you know if the WeCane is covered by insurance? Or would you be out of pocket costs for, um, for clients? Oh, so the WeWalk at this moment, I don't know that it's covered, but um, one other thing that I did not mention, um, I'm working closely with um, the UPMC health plan uh, with the CHC dual enrollment programs. And we're trying to look at the, the opportunity for people to have assist, assistive technology covered. And so there, we're looking at, you know, the criteria to have that happen. So we're hopeful that, you know, because obviously these uh, pieces of equipment are very expensive. Uh, again, I go back to the iPad and the, and the Apple iPhone. Those are things if a person has, they can make tremendous use out of them and they're less expensive than some of the other things. But we're really hopeful that with this uh, partnership that we can help to um, get people covered, you know, for the equipment that they need, because it is very, very important to keep them engaged in the quality of life that they want to maintain. Thank you. I think we. I think you answered the next person's question as well, regarding um, availability and in, in, uh, insurance and so forth. So, the other thing uh, I wanted, Lonnie. The other thing yeah. I wanted to mention in Pennsylvania, there is a program. Uh, you do have to meet certain criteria. It's called Tech Owl that um, does help uh, give some uh, iPads out, but you have to meet certain. Uh, uh, criteria for that. And there's also something called Computers for the Blind, where they will, at a, a very a slight fee, they will build a computer with the needs that you have. And, you know, you have an option to buy it, like the, uh, the monitor and so on. So that's another thing that's available. And some of these things are not often, you know, a lot of people don't know about them. And I think that um, certainly if someone would have a, a question, they can reach out to us and we'll be happy to give them as much information as we know at the time. A lot of the information uh, is changing. And so if anyone in the audience is interested, you can listen to great podcasts about low vision and vision technology, and you'll really get a, a lot of information that's kind of up to date because the people that do those podcasts are really uh, dynamic. That's fantastic. Um, is there any research about using advanced technology in the clinic and generalizing to the client's home or community? How is this addressed in clinic? So I think, Lonnie, part of what we're trying to do is, um, you know, there's not a lot of research um, out about, you know, functional ability and low vision or, you know, do like what, you know, these things actually mean. I mean, we know they work because we see it in clinical practice, but there's not a ton of, you know, evidence-based medicine to say like, you know, X, Y, and Z works for X, Y, and Z work for X, Y, and Z conditions. So I think that now um, with the support of Dr. Sahel, the Ioneer Foundation, we're actually gonna be able to contribute to that literature, especially such as the Iris Vision Study to actually prove that these devices um, improve patients' functional performance. And then I think we're gonna see as that literature base mounts that we will, um, we will be able to vet insurances or ask insurances, hey, listen, 
we can prove that this works, can this now be covered through your programs? So I think that that um, I think that's coming, and I think that's where we're actively really trying to participate in being a force to to make that happen. Yeah, and that, that goes to what you said, Dr. Sahel, right? Uh, sorry. Yeah, I want to echo that. I mean, the what we have done, for example, for the Irish vision, we have absolutely no commercial interest in it. We are just doing that because we want to assess in real life with patients in a structured study what benefit it brings to the patient, what type of tweaks to the technology can be proposed to make it even better. But we want to also demonstrate uh, and really have a real understanding of when this is useful and how it is useful. And we are totally independent from the manufacturer. And so the idea is really that we, it's not just a case by case story and people have, can have reports of one story, a nice story. It's not marketing, it's really making sure that this is really useful. And it will be uh, because it's a process. We are, the, as, as Holly and Dr. Smith are pointing out, we are in the early days of all these technologies that are evolving so fast and we can contribute to build, build the interface between the patients and the people that develop the technologies to make sure that we are really adapted to them and they can really help people. Instead of having the people adapt to the technologies, we need to make sure that they are useful for them. Thank you. And, and I, you know, um, got a chance to see Dr. Sahel's uh, uh, street lab in Paris, which essentially is that functional assessment tool that referred to. And as this becomes uh, something we do more in Pittsburgh, you'll hopefully get a chance to tour that in, in our new uh, Vision Institute in a few years. Yeah. Um, uh, will, will you see someone in your clinic if they have, if they're nonverbal, have a neuromuscular disease affecting yeah. their speech and doing? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, yeah, we see that quite frequently. So absolutely, we see people that have visual impairments, uh, multiple motor ability impairments. We have people that are hearing impaired. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that, that, that without question, for sure. How many occupational therapists are employed in your clinic? Uh, so we have three. Uh, we have Holly, who's here with us all the time. Um, we have um, a woman by the name of Maria Shoemaker, who's here, who works both um, in the clinic and with our research patients. And we have Dana Arevich, who um, does a lot of telemedicine um, and telerehabilitation through, through the clinic as well. Where is your clinic and how would I access it? Uh, the clinic is currently um, at uh, Ioneer Institute in Oakland in Pittsburgh. Um, it is on the seventh floor. I'm here um, all week. I, I, I don't travel to our satellite clinics because there's a lot of equipment that um, needs, that kind of needs to be involved. Uh, so it's not always easily transportable. So it's here. And then um, if you call the main scheduling number, um, they, they can certainly uh, help, which is 412-647-2200. Uh, I, I'm going to go back to a question up here because I think it, some may be interested. Um, uh, do you work in tandem with the VA in Oakland to help combat patients who that needs and in, in adaptive issues? And so, forth? so for sure. I mean, I uh, am very familiar with the, the program at the VA. Um, I know there's a low vision optometrist there who's fantastic and a wonderful, wonderful um, low vision occupational therapist within the system. So we do work in conjunction with them um, by basically, you know, if we evaluate a patient and we know that they meet the criteria through the Veterans Administration, we then help them get that, them plugged into that program um, so that the devices can be covered through the system, that they can be do the rehabilitation through the system. And there's actually, you know, an inpatient facility as well that can be really beneficial. So yeah, we have a close working uh, relationship with the Veterans Administration for sure. Okay, uh, what is the timeline for your clinic moving from Oakland to the new Vision Rehabilitation Hospital um, site? Dr. Sehal maybe. Yeah, so while the construction is progressing, uh, there was some impact of COVID, but uh, limited impact because uh, the institution has been extremely uh, for what coming to make this happen. So the building should be completed in two years from now. There will be probably a trial period to make sure that everything is working and, uh, and functional. So we 
we hope to be able to move to move into the building in the first half of 2023. And uh, then we'll have this uh, wonderful uh, full suite dedicated to low vision and rehabilitation, uh, including a garden, uh, an outside garden, an internal uh, street lab, so many facilities that don't exist in many places, if any. Awesome. Yeah, well, we'll be very fortunate with the new building because um, the low vision suite is going to be pretty spectacular. There'll be a full functioning apartment so patients can participate in actually functional activities such as cooking, how making the bed, you know, cleaning, doing things like that. And with Dr. Sal mentioning with the garden, there'll be different terrains, whether it's gravel or dirt or pavement, so we can actually look at somebody's functional mobility. Um, so we're actually quite blessed um, to be able to be part of of that, I think you know many places, like Dr. Sell said, that does just does not exist. And the synergy with uh, BVRS, uh, the Blind and Vision Rehabilitation Services, that are will be just next door, is going to be amazing because it's really, really going to be a complementary approach to tackle visual impairment together. Absolutely. Well, thank you, um, everyone. Thank you for our our speakers, our panelists, and thank you so much to all of you who attended today. We had a very large turnout, and uh, obviously we, again, uh, understand that this is a topic that, uh, that many of you um, uh, are looking for information on, and we're happy to provide it. So uh, please, uh, as I said, fill out your surveys, but also if you have questions, feel free to send them via email to uh, the email in your invitation to Mr. Craig Smith and we'll get them to, um, to the right people. Thank you again. Have a wonderful rest of your Friday afternoon. Bye. Have a good day.